Today, I'm going to count down some reality shows that haven't been canceled as of the date of this video, but are fake or have some crazy fake elements in them. What? Reality shows aren't real? Okay, we know there are fake reality shows out there, but we don't always know which parts are fake. I'm going to break them down for you. This may ruin one or some of your favorite reality shows. So enter at your own risk. You've been warned. Hey there, hey. I'm Tamara from Tamara Lynette Tales. Let's go. Coming in at number 10, Say Yes to the Dress. Say Yes to the Dress is a show I've enjoyed watching on and off over the years. They follow brides as they try on wedding dresses for their upcoming nuptials. They film Say Yes to the Dress in New York and Atlanta, but they seem to favor the New York bridal store Kleinfields for the most part. So when watching the show, viewers are given the impression that shopping at Kleinfields is an intimate, a luxury experience. Well, in actuality, Kleinfelds is anything but that. The shop is not as large as it looks on TV. Brides are often jam-packed into the shop, feel stressed, and are usually rushed to get through their appointments. Because there are so many brides trying on dresses at the same time, no bride has a dedicated mirror. So brides often have to wait in line to stand on a platform to see the dress from multiple angles, keeping in mind that the clock is ticking on their appointment. On the show, the dresses look so immaculate, like to the point of making Cinderella jealous. But in actuality, those dresses are beat down. So much so that some brides have complained that they can't even get a good idea of what they will look like in it. The dresses are dirty, have sweat stains, and look like someone was doing burpees in the middle of Times Square in them. As for the bride's friends and family who sit on the couches who offer their opinions of the dresses, producers require the brides to submit a list of names and personality traits of each person they are bringing to their appointment. From that, the producers pick the people who they think will give the most controversial opinions to interview on the confessional cam. They will also ask those who are sitting on the couch who are serving up unpopular opinions to repeat them in a way that will hopefully cause a disagreement amongst the bridal party. Number nine, Master Chef. Master Chef is one of a ton of cooking competitions. In this one, amateur and home cooks compete to win the title of Master Chef and a cash prize of 250,000 smackaroos. Wow, that's a lot of cash for cooking up some type of head cheese, ladyfinger tartare, chocolate ganache, truffle dish. Anyway, contestants have complained that their words were sliced and diced to form a sentence they never said. See what I did there, sliced and diced? Okay, anyway, to me, one of the best parts of cooking competitions are those last few seconds when the chefs are running to grab plates, hands are shaking, and they're just tossing food on the plate before the time runs out. Well, on this show, those frantic moments are fake. So this is what happens. After the timer goes off, they do make them step away from their plates. However, they have them return to the plates and pretend to be rushing and nervous so that they can record them in different camera angles. Well, at least they don't allow them to add to their dish. They have to get their mime on and pretend to be stressed. Oh, and another thing, on the show, it appears as though the judges taste the food immediately after it's cooked. Not true. After the dishes are prepared, production crew takes the dishes and shoots them at different angles, like a little food porn photo shoot then puts them in a the refrigerator. Everyone goes to lunch and then after lunch, they restage everything and the judges pretend to enjoy the cold food. Ew, dang, can they at least stick them in the microwave for 47 seconds? Number eight, Fixer Upper. HTV's favorite couple, Chip and Joanna Gaines' popular show, Fixer Upper, helps home buyers choose which busted house to buy out of three options. Then Chip and Joanna swoop in and wave their wooden wand to transform it into an Instagram-worthy oasis. But what they don't tell you is Chip and Joanna aren't really trying to help the home buyers find a house. Nope. 
Well, let me explain. They do film them in at least three different homes, but in order to be considered to be on the show, the home buyers already have to be under contract to purchase a home. So when they're out looking at homes, they're already on the hook for one of the three. They're just pretending to be interested in the other two, which are most likely not even for sale in real life. Oh, and after the homeowner gets picked for the show, they send the home's plans to production so they can start working on design ideas before they even start taping the actual episode. So much for them being design geniuses on the spot like they make it seem. Chip is often shown working on the renovations like just another part of the crew. Child, that's just for the cameras. Once those cameras go away, so does Chip. The crew does all of the work. Also, I know from my own experience from being on a home renovation show that they have a no sweat rule. So next time you watch a home makeover show, take note that the main characters are never sweaty no matter how hot it is. They may have a little tinge of sweat under their armpit, but the production crew keeps multiple of the same shirt on deck so they can have the host change into a sweat-free one in between takes. So anyway, back to Fixer Upper. They try to give us the impression that they are handing the new homeowners a completely made over home, but that's not true. They usually don't renovate the entire house, just the few rooms they share on the show. Now, when it comes to these fix or upper makeovers, the best part is the makeover itself, right? The perfectly designed spaces with all of the beautiful furniture and decorations, but that's fake too. Okay, well, let's say it's deceptive. They do add all of the furniture and decorations, but only for the viewers to give us the best reveal possible. Yeah, they try to make it seem like they work within these families' budgets to make over their homes, but they don't. If the homeowner can't afford to purchase the furniture, production packs that stuff up, smacks it in the back of a truck, and hauls it right back to Joanna's warehouse because most of that stuff came from her online store. Because of the expense, usually the homeowners keep their own furniture, so we don't really get to see the final look of most of these homes. Coming in at number seven, The Voice. The Voice is a singing competition where the contestants compete against each other to win the title of being the voice and the celebrity judges compete against each other to have the person they mentored win the competition. One of the unique aspects of The Voice is that the contestants have to perform a blind audition where the judges have their backs turned while the person sings and they have no idea who the singer is and many times can't even discern their gender, making the judges have to base their decisions strictly on the contestants' vocal skills. Well, that's not all true. Before the audition starts, Start, the judges are given a bio of each and every contestant. They know their name, what they do for a living, and even interesting factoids about them. They claim they do this because it makes for better TV to have the judges armed with information they can use to ask good questions after the person auditions. So when the judges are surprised, like when they see someone audition from a previous season and they're like, hey Carol, oh my God, I didn't know that was you. I remember you. They're faking it. They knew exactly who that person was before they swung their chair around. The voice gives us the impression that they find their talent from open auditions, which is true, but they also have a team that is dedicated to aggressively scouting singers and even guarantee certain scoutees a spot to audition for the judges on the show. Part of the appeal of being on The Voice is the opportunity to be coached and mentored by one of the celebrity judges. But unfortunately, not all of the judges coach and mentor their singers. For example, Shakira apparently pretended to coach her team. When cameras were rolling, she did a few me, 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 me's with them. But once the cameras stopped rolling, child, they were on their own. Another thing, the show's producers have been known to create fake drama between the judges. After all, the judges want their share of the spotlight too, I guess. So during the auditions, when the judges hit their buttons to turn their chairs around, there's this slightly dramatic whoosh sound. But in real life, the chairs are completely silent. The whoosh sound is edited in later. Just like Instagram models love them a good filter, The Voice loves them a good voice filter. 
According to a previous contestant, the editors enhance their vocals so what the TV audience hears is not the authentic audition. Finally, the contestants don't usually get to choose the songs that they sing, which doesn't sound all that terrible, except they often are scolded for the songs that they sing. Number six, Naked and Afraid. Naked and Afraid is a survival show that takes two cast members and dumps them in the middle of nowhere, like the Amazon forest. They strip them butt naked with only a couple of tools to use, like a fire starter and a gum wrapper, then films them as they attempt to live off the land for three whole weeks. It's great, except it doesn't really play out that way behind the scenes. What we don't see is production giving cast members things like food, supplements like vitamin C and salt, tampons, chocolate, and even emergency. Sounds like they have my old high school nurse, Mrs. Appletree, working on that set. But this defeats their entire premise of what happens when you place two people in the middle of nowhere and force them to live off the land. So get this. One cast member said that prior to being dropped off to start the show, a crew member gave her a curry dish, which caused her to have food poisoning, right? So producers encouraged her to do the show anyway, even though she would be starting out sick and feeling like crap. So after working a little magic in the editing room, what they did was make it look like she drank dirty water and caused herself to get sick. Naked and afraid. How you gonna feed a girl bad food that makes her sick, but then turn around and make it look like she drank water out of an alligator's mouth and got herself sick? <laughs> you ain't right. So the show claims that the contestants agree to do the show for bragging rights, like the thrill of the challenge and to increase their PSR score, which stands for primitive survival rating, leading us to believe no money exchanges hand between the production and the contestants. Lies, not true. Former contestants have spilled the tea and said that they are given a financial incentive if they make it to 21 days. If they do, they are rumored to receive around $20,000 of cold, hard cash. And another thing, apparently these ultra remote locations that they are dumped off at aren't as wild and untapped as they would make it seem. The production camp is really close by. Contestants have interacted with locals and some have even heard music playing from other campers unrelated to the show. Imagine watching that show and hearing Beyonce bumping in the background. Dang, this show almost sounds like they're just at a campground naked. Number five, 90 Day Fiance. 90 Day Fiance is a show that follows the love story of couples who have applied for a K-1 visa because one of them lives in a different country. Once that person arrives in the U.S., the couple only has 90 days to get married. Since its inception, the show has created several franchises. Before the 90 Days, 90 Day Fiance the Other Way, Single Life, and so on. So multiple cast members have spoken out about how fake this show is. Overall, it kind of sounds like a couple's first season on the show is fairly real, but when they're asked back to do additional seasons, this is where it goes left down fakery lane. For example, Stephanie Davidson was featured in season eight. She was in love with Ryan from Belize and working to bring him to the US. They eventually broke up before it was time to take the next season. When she informed the producers, they didn't care. Instead, she and the producers came up with a storyline where Stephanie decided to have a relationship with Ryan's cousin, Harris. The only thing is, Harris was already in a relationship with his kid's mom, lived with her and everything. They did reveal that information at the end of the season to make it look like he deceived her, but Stephanie Harris and the producers all planned this from the beginning. Devin Clegg was featured in seasons one and two. She claims her storyline of moving to Korea to be with her new husband was fake. The only reason she was there for a few weeks was because the show made her go as part of her contract. Ashley and Jay from season six broke their NDA and admitted that their storyline of him having an active Tinder account and her filing for divorce because of it was fake. She did eventually file for divorce, but it was several months later and for different reasons. I mean, the fake stories go on and on. Clearly the producers know that the viewers love drama, so they create some when there is none. Rolling in at number four is Storage Wars. Storage Wars is a show that follows a group of professionals who purchase storage units that are in default. They're hoping to find Grandma Jenkins jewels, assuming she didn't get them at Walmart. But what they don't tell you is that many of the valuable items found in the storage units 
are placed there by production, the crew goes to antique stores, purchases items, and puts them in the units. Now, they don't do this 100% of the time, but to keep the viewers interested, they'll add unusual items that have value. Or what they'll do is combine the contents of multiple units into one. Now, throughout an episode, the cast members are shown talking to the camera, giving their interviews, like after winning a storage space. Those interviews are scripted. One of the producers actually admitted that he's tired of narration-driven stories, so the cast is given a script to explain their particular story for the episode. Oh, and get this, the show often features the cast members at a live auction bidding against each other, head-to-head, -head, sometimes getting heated. Well, those scenes are fake. There is no live auction going on. The film crew stages it. And finally, the cast is often seen going to appraisers to get valuations of the treasures the production crew staged in their unit. Well, many of those appraisers are not real appraisers. It's not clear whether they are hired actors or a producer's cousin, but they are just reading from a script or making it up as they go along. Number three, Pawn Stars. Pawn Stars follows a family that owns a pawn shop. They show customers coming into the store with rare, unusual, valuable, and not so valuable artifacts for the crew to evaluate and hopefully receive an offer from the pawn shop to buy it for big bucks. The main players of the show give us the impression that they are on their daily grind, like in the shop every day. Not true. The shop has about 50 employees. Most of the cast on the show only go into the shop on the days that they have to tape the show. As for some of the customers who are featured, they are vetted ahead of time and have already negotiated the price they're willing to sell their item for. So they are real customers, but everyone is pretending like they just met, have no idea what the customer is bringing in the store or how much it's worth and whether or not the customer is going to agree to their offer to purchase that item or not. So I guess basically the show's like a reenactment show. The customers are coached on how to behave in front of the camera. Many of them are super nervous and have to say their lines multiple times. Some items never even make it on the show because the customer was so bad and not able to pull their nervousness together on camera. Also, it's not unusual for them to hire people to pretend to be customers or appraising experts. Oh, and if there's a cool item they want to feature on the show, they'll have a friend or family member come on and pretend to sell them that item. When they're not taping the show, the pawn shop is more of a tourist destination now with a long line to get in. So they've decided to capitalize on this and now sell t-shirts, teddy bears, bobbleheads and stuff. So I guess it's more like a museum with a crappy gift shop now. Number two, Catfish. Catfish is a show where two hosts investigate online dating scams. Usually the scams are crimes of the heart, where a person is pretending to be someone else and chat with unsuspecting victims, causing them to fall in love. Eventually, the victim suspects they are being catfished, so they contact the show and they launch an investigation to dig up the true identity of the catfisher. Now, that's a great concept for a show. The only problem is it's all fake because what really happens is the person doing the catfishing contacts the show. So all of their super clever detective work they do to discover who the catfisher is, is completely bogus. I mean, before they're even chosen for the show, the catfishers already voluntarily gone through psychologist assessments and submitted to background checks. This show is so fake. The hosts usually start the show with an email from the person who suspects they are being catfished. They explain their pitiful situation and beg for help. Yeah, well, clearly that's fake too. Those emails are written by the crew. What really happens is the catfisher reaches out to the show. The person who is a victim is then contacted by the show and asked if they would like to participate. And from there, the fake reality begins. Production has also been accused of making participants lie about timelines and force identities on them, like making them say they were questioning their sexuality when they really weren't. 
also the basis of the show is that these are romantic relationships but former participants have said that they were just friends but were told to pretend they were romantic loving relationships by the crew and finally the show is set up to where the biggest moment is to get to where the catfish eat gets to face their catfisher for the first time and meet face to face in person. They really build it up where the host will either drive or fly the catfish E to an agreed upon meeting spot. Everyone is nervous. Will the catfisher show up? Will they look like their pictures? Nobody knows. Well, except they do. The catfisher and their friend, neighbor, or mama always roll up fully mic'd and ready for their close up. Because after all, they are the ones who reached out to be on the show in the first place. I mean, the only thing that is probably real about this show is that a catfish may have happened. Otherwise, this show is as fake as these acrylic teeth fingernails. And the number one fakest reality show currently on television, House Hunters. The show House Hunters follows potential home buyers on their journey to finding a new home. On the show, the realtor takes them to multiple homes to consider. They narrow it down to their top three, then reveal which house they're going to purchase. The only problem here is that it's all fake. I actually have a friend who was on this show, so I have some firsthand knowledge about their trickery. Like, in order to get on the show, participants have to already know which house they're going to purchase. And in many cases, they are in escrow or have already purchased their new home. So their house hunting days are already over and done with before they even start filming. The houses the realtors take the homeowners to aren't usually for sale. In my friend's case, one of the houses she looked at was her realtor's and the other one belonged to her friend and of course the third one was her own. It's extremely common for the show to use homes belonging to the participants, friends, and family. So really, the house hunting journey they're sharing with viewers is just a tour of a home that's not for sale. When deciding which house to purchase, they always have the homeowners weigh the pros and cons of each home. However, the homeowners don't always dislike the features they point out. Producers encourage them to point out negative aspects of each house to throw the viewer off the scent of which house they're going to pick. Finally, the real estate brokers shown on the show aren't always realtors. Sometimes it's a friend of the homeowner or some random person placed in that role by production. So what is real about this show? The only real thing about it is that somebody somewhere bought a house. Otherwise, the houses they considered, the realtors showing the houses, and their opinions about each house are fake. So with all of this said, as much as reality shows aren't real, they are still my little secret guilty pleasure. Well, I guess it's not so secret since I just told you, but you know what I mean. Were you surprised by any of this trickery? Let me know in the comments and thanks for hanging out with me. See you in my next video.